personally salute all frontliners who have worked tirelessly and innovators who have been a solution to prevent and treat COVID-19 and other crisis situations, or an initiative which has contributed towards mitigating the impacts of coronavirus and providing relief to communities. I have observed abundant creativity and innovation emerging at the national, institutional, and organizational, and individual levels for the past year. Now is the ideal time for initiatives like this to be explored, not only encourage development of innovation, but to manage future emergencies and crises. Sejak mencapai kemerdekaan, Malaysia telah mengalami transformasi yang pesat demi kemamuran dan kesejahteraan rakyat. Sektor kesihatan antara sektor terpenting negara sentiasa berhadapan dengan pelbagai isu dan cabaran dalam era globalisasi ini. Fokus Kementerian Kesihatan menjadi lebih luas, terutamanya dalam menyediakan kemudahan kesihatan yang saksama, mudah diperolehi dan berkualiti. Untuk itu, perancangan dan pelaksanaan program kesihatan negara perlulah berasaskan kepada bukti saintifik menerusi hasil-hasil penyelidikan yang berkualiti. Penubuhan Institut Kesihatan Negara atau NIH yang bernaung di bawah program penyelidikan dan sokongan teknikal Kementerian Kesihatan Malaysia adalah bertujuan untuk menjalankan penyelidikan yang mana hasilnya dapat memberi bukti saintifik terhadap pembentukan polisi dan intervensi bidang kesihatan. NIH telah diluluskan di bawah rancangan Malaysia ke-7 dan secara rasmi beroperasi sejak bulan Ogos 2003. Visi NIH adalah untuk menjadi organisasi penyelidikan kesihatan terkemuka ke arah meningkatkan kesihatan dan kesejahteraan negara. Manakala misi NIH adalah menjalankan penyelidikan, latihan dan perundingan berkaitan kesihatan yang berkesan dan berimpak tinggi untuk meningkatkan kualiti hidup. Selain itu, NIH juga bertanggungjawab untuk mentadbir dan menguruskan penyelidikan di negara ini untuk menangani isu-isu kesihatan nasional. Kompleks NIH seluas 40 eka di Setia Alam Selangor mempunyai ciri-ciri seni bina moden yang melambangkan kerancakan transformasi perkhidmatan kesihatan yang dizahirkan oleh penyelidikan yang berkualiti tinggi. 
Dilengkapi dengan pelbagai fasiliti serba moden, NIH turut menekankan kepentingan ekosistem alam sekitar yang mampu mewujudkan suasana kondusif untuk penyelidikan. Kompleks NIH menempatkan sebanyak enam buah institut yang mempunyai penghususan dalam bidang penyelidikan masing-masing. Kelancaran operasi setiap institut ini disokong oleh pejabat pengurus dan pejabat pendaftar yang menjadi tunjang utama dalam pengurusan strategik dan pentadbiran NIH. Institut Penyelidikan Perubatan atau IMR merupakan institut penyelidikan biomedikal tertua di Malaysia yang diwujudkan sejak tahun 1900 oleh kerajaan British. Ketika itu, ia dikenali sebagai Institut Pathology di Kuala Lumpur. Hasil penyelidikan IMR telah banyak menyumbang kepada pengetahuan, pemahaman, rawatan dan kawalan beberapa penyakit tropika utama di negara ini dan rantau Asia Tenggara. Kini, fokus IMR juga kepada penyelidikan bioperubatan seiring dengan tren perubahan isu dan beban kesihatan negara serta kemajuan teknologi perubatan. Sejarah Institut Kesihatan Umum, IKU, bermula di Singapura sebagai Royal Sanitary Institute dan dijenamakan sebagai Royal Society for Promotion of Health, RSH, yang berperanan melatih Inspektor Kesihatan dari Tanah Melayu, Singapura dan Borneo. IKU berkembang menjadi pusat penyelidikan epidemiologi dan kesihatan awam yang menyediakan data-data kesihatan penting pembuat dasar dan pihak berkepentingan mengenai prevalen penyakit dan taraf kesihatan rakyat negara ini. Antaranya adalah tinjauan kebangsaan kesihatan dan morbiditi at National Health Morbidity Survey yang dijalankan secara berkala. Institut Penyelidikan Klinikal atau ICR berfungsi sebagai cabang penyelidikan klinikal KKM dan mula beroperasi sejak Ogos 2000. Dengan lima buah pusat kajian yang berperanan menggerakkan kajian-kajian klinikal tersendiri serta mempunyai 36 cawangan di hospital-hospital utama KKM di seluruh negara, ICR memainkan peranan penting dalam menerajui pembangunan dan pengukuhan kapasiti penyelidikan klinikal negara, mewujudkan dan mengekalkan pengkalan data klinikal bagi KKM dan juga mewujudkan kerjasama dengan organisasi penyelidikan tempatan, serantau dan antarabangsa mengenai penyelidikan klinikal. Institut Penyelidikan Sistem Kesihatan atau IHSR ditubuhkan pada November 2002 bagi membantu KKM dalam perlaksanaan penyelidikan terhadap sistem dan pengurusan kesihatan negara yang membantu dalam menyediakan bukti saintifik kepada pengubal dasar dan polisi kesihatan negara mengenai taraf dan kualiti penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan kepada rakyat. Institut ini berperanan dalam melaksanakan penyelidikan berimpak tinggi dalam bidang penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan negara, melaksanakan penilaian terhadap dasar dan polisi kesihatan dan keboleh capaian perkhidmatan yang saksama dan berkualiti dalam kalangan semua rakyat negara ini. IHSR telah mendapat pengiktirafan antarabangsa dan telah dilantik sebagai pusat kerjasama serantau WHO untuk peningkatan kualiti dan kesihatan. Institut Pengurusan Kesihatan, IHM, bermula di bawah Institut Kesihatan Awam yang dikenali sebagai bahagian latihan pengurusan. Penubuhan IHM bermula pada rancangan Malaysia ke-6 yang mana ia bertanggungjawab dalam meningkatkan pembangunan modal insan profesional di KKM untuk menghadapi cabaran dalam penyampaian perkhidmatan kesihatan yang berkualiti. Bidang penyelidikan yang dipelopori oleh IHM ialah aspek kepuasan pelanggan, pengurusan sumber manusia serta pemantauan dan penilaian terhadap kualiti perkhidmatan kesihatan negara. Selain itu, IHM turut berperanan sebagai sebuah institut yang menyediakan latihan berkualiti tinggi kepada kaki tangan KKM. Institut Penyelidikan Tingkah Laku Kesihatan IPTK ditubuhkan pada 2005 adalah bukti bahawa bidang tingkah laku kesihatan adalah penting dalam usaha mencapai sebuah negara maju. IPTK bertanggungjawab dalam melaksanakan penyelidikan inovatif dalam bidang tingkah laku, penilaian intervensi promosi kesihatan, kaedah komunikasi kesihatan yang efektif dan komunikasi risiko. 
Penyelidikan yang dilaksanakan oleh penyelidik-penyelidik di NIH bukan sahaja telah memperbaiki penyampaian kesihatan kepada rakyat Malaysia, namun telah turut mendapat pengiktirafan di dalam negara dan di peringkat antarabangsa. Way Forward NIH akan terus mengkaji dan meningkatkan kepakaran para penyelidik ke arah menghasilkan kajian-kajian berkualiti dan berimpak tinggi dalam meningkatkan taraf kesihatan dan kehidupan rakyat Malaysia. Ladies and gentlemen, our next lined up program is a knowledge sharing session. Please enjoy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor Vignes Warren, and I'm a professor and senior consultant neurosurgeon at University of Malaya. I would like to firstly like to thank the organizers and University of Malaya for having selected my presentation to be presented at this conference. My topic for the day is smart glasses, the next step in medical communication. Now, communication in medicine is essential. People always talk about communication between doctors and patients. But there's actually serious amounts of communication that occurs between doctors, doctors and nursing staff uh, on various issues. The primary reason is actually to discuss clinical problems and to obtain opinions for more senior colleagues who may not be on site. This is very, very important because hospitals exist at different layers of specialization, different layers of expertise, and sometimes one needs to get expert opinion from doctors who may not be in hospital, especially during emergencies in the evenings and nights. This is also important to reassure patients that their problems are being discussed with appropriate people with appropriate experience. Communication in medicine is also essential for quality control to make sure that what the more junior doctors are doing is up to standard. And perhaps it's important in education. Now, the progression of communication has uh, progressed over the years. In the era of writing letters and waiting for a reply on what problems, I suppose previous to this, we were even sending smoke signals to then face-to-face -face meetings. More recently, we have used telephones to describe, and this technique is still being used today. In this technique, a, doc a junior doctor would call a senior doctor irrespective of time of day and explain everything there used to be known of patient in words. So imagine at 2 o'clock if you have to try and understand what a scan of a patient's brain shows uh, uh, when someone is describing what they are seeing. More recently, people have been using internet, uh, that is computers uh, with, co with communication. Now, this allows the transfer of various data and images. And even more recently, image transfer using JPEG and MPEG over the telephone. Now, this really made communication very convenient. However, Numerous questions regarding securitization and privacy have arisen from time to time. Today, more complex software that allows secure transfer of data by internet over computers and mobile devices exists to overcome some of the previous concerns. However, the consultant clinician on the other side almost never gets to see the patient. Uh, when consultations are usually done, uh, especially during emergencies, the consultant uh, the most senior consultant only gets to look at or hear about uh, blood results or whatever investigation results and imaging and hardly ever get to see the patient. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, created the much used word cliche, much, much used cliche about the new normal. And is this an opportunity to say, to do things differently? At the time of panda the pandemic, there was problems in infection control policies. Physical distancing was a requirement and critical care rounds for limitation. It was very common to see 10 doctors in an ICU round. But during the pandemic, often only one or two people were allowed to see the patients, with sometimes more senior staff outside the room. There was PPE and specialist manpower shortage. And in complex neurosurgical patients where there was communications between junior doctors and more senior consultants, um, sometimes uh, the communications fell through, especially in complex problems, because the usual adage, the eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know, pops up when the junior sometimes does not know what the more important uh, symptoms or signs or questions to ask. 
So we tried to pioneer, or we pioneered the use of smart glasses uh, during the pandemic period. This is an example of what we did. So we were sending doctors into our neurosurgical intensive care unit wearing a smart glasses. The top view shows you without the PPE and the lower view with the PPE on. The outcome of our study was published uh, in World Neurosurgery and it received good uh, review remarks uh, because it showed a very innovative method of approaching a problem. So we studied 10 ward rounds consisting of somewhere between 6 and 14 patients on each ward round where a junior doctor would do a running commentary ward round as he visited the patient and following the, with the senior consultant. Following that, the consultant did a ward round by himself in the rounds and a comparison was made between the results made uh, through a virtual ward round and from a direct ward round. In addition to that, the people who were involved in it, their opinions were also sought and various problems that raised were also discussed. So this was approximately a schematic. This is a schematic upon how this was done. So a junior doctor seeing a patient will be able to consult with other ICU members or also consult directly with a specialist. Or sometimes he could have more than two specialists being consulted upon via using smart glasses via telemedicine. Uh, I'll just briefly go through the results. There was a high concordance rate uh, between the two ward rounds. And when we were comparing the outcome between both a physical ward round and a virtual ward round, the results were very good. And most doctors found that uh, the satisfaction rate and the acceptance was quite high for various things. Uh, we looked at things like technical quality, clarity, the overall decision-making process, etc. And we found that this was very useful. Can the following is a video now? that showed an example of a communication. And yeah. you can see in this communication, the doctor seated yeah. in a room is able to give a variety of instructions to the more junior doctor who is doing the ward round. In addition to actually being able to see what is going on and having his instructions being carried out and viewing it, he or she is also able to view the results of uh, uh, physiological monitors as well as to see CT scans and MRI scans. Okay. All right. Show me the scan that you explained to me earlier. So it's a CT scan. Okay, that's the SPH, right? Yeah, there's some SPH and some computation. Alright, so what's the plan now? The plan now is to, uh, we are winning off the solution. So to wake up the patient and then uh, the first it just recovery, probably you're in the patient. Okay, thanks. Now, we have seen a wide potential usage in this. Whilst this study was limited to the neuro ICU and award round, we think that this can be used in other areas as well. Conclusion. It is proven that telemedicine via slot gases in neuro ICU during ward rounds in UMMC was feasible, acceptable, and effective. And we feel that medical communication widespread why a smart glasses would be the future standard of care. We actually see this being used in other areas beyond the ICU, such as in emergency department, possibly in ambulances, in operating theatres where junior doctors want to consult with senior doctors when there is a troublesome situation, or even to for senior doctors to monitor junior doctors to ensure quality of care. It is well within the realm of possibility, within the next five years, we will start to see doctors walking around the hospital with a pair of smart glasses on. While this technology did not catch on initially when giants like Google tried to implement it about five to ten years ago, the pandemic has taught us that this is a good method of doing consultations where uh, patients are ensured that they are being seen by more senior personnel who may not uh, who, may, who it might not be possible to be around at that point. 
So what the future holds? We see communications in emergency, communications for supervision, remote communications from rural areas in the field, and also possibly in teaching. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Hi, good day. Uh, I'm Professor Dr. Moi Fong Ming from the Department of Social and Parentive Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Today, I would like to share our research findings on mental health status and its associated factors among COVID-19 survivors in the community. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in many devastating effects in terms of economic loss, morbidity and mortality globally. As of June 20th, 2022, Globally, COVID-19 pandemic has caused 6.32 million deaths and 539 million confirmed cases worldwide. In Malaysia, there were 4.5 million COVID-19 cases with 35,732 deaths. The virus of SARS-CoV-2 affects the respiratory, nervous, renal and cardiovascular systems. With the increase in COVID-19 cases, mental health issues are being recognised as an important consequence of COVID-19 infection. Mental health implication on COVID actually affects the acute COVID as well as the post-COVID. For acute COVID-19 patients, there's a reported high prevalence of anxiety and depression, which the contributing factors could be the effects of the viral infection, the immunological response, medical interventions or treatment, social isolation, physical, uh, psychological impact and concern about infecting others and stigma. As for post-COVID conditions, the prevalence of uh, the anxiety could be due to being worried, fear, guilt, stigma or when the patient recovered but still experienced some post-COVID symptoms, they may be uncertain about their prognosis and future. COVID-19 survivors with mental health disorders are at greater risk for decreased quality of life, lower work productivity, social problems and other health problems. In Malaysia, there are 4.48 million COVID-19 survivors in the community, but there are little data on their mental health status. We aim to investigate the mental health status in the form of depression among COVID-19 survivors in the community and its associated factors. So it, is a, it was a cross-sectional study conducted from July to September 2021 during MCO and the data was collect collected using an online questionnaire, RedCap. The questionnaire was prepared in English, translated into the Malay language and the Chinese language, distributed in social media, COVID-19 support group webpage and news media. Ethics clearance was obtained from the University of Malaya Research Ethics Committee and informed consent was obtained before data collection. So the questionnaire covers information such as social demographic characteristics of the patients, existing comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, self-perception on health, information on the acute COVID-19 condition, symptoms and duration of post-COVID condition, as well as mental health status. So mental health status in the form of depression was measured using the patient health questionnaire PHQ-9, where sleep, exhaustion, changes in appetite, difficulties with concentration, suicidal thoughts over the past two weeks were inquired. So higher score indicating greater severity of depression. In the current analysis, the PHQ-9 scores were categorized into normal from 0 to 4 and abnormal 5 to 27. The results, we had a total of 732 COVID survivors who participated. They were more females in the younger age group in their 20s and 30s with tertiary education. Slightly more than half of them were overweight or obese. Majority were free of comorbidities because they were young, so not many of them were with uh, diseases. Half of them had no symptoms or with mild symptoms during their acute COVID-19 infection. Two-thirds of them perceived to be in good health currently. And one in five reported to experience long COVID. About half of the respondents had abnormal score for PHQ-9, meaning that about half of them 
had, uh, were at risk for depression. So if you look at this uh, table, we find that females are at higher odds of, uh, for depression and those who were youngest, uh, younger ones, the 20s, 30s, were at higher odds for depression. Females um, were more likely to, to get depressed probably because uh, they play multiple roles as mother, daughter and wife. And on top of that, they are also working. So um, the impact of COVID had a greater effect on them. And those in the younger age groups, they may be worried about their future, their employment chance opportunities, as the data was, uh, the data was collected during MCO. Um, in addition, they may, not, they, are res they may not be so resilient compared to the older age group in facing uh, stress and uh, during uh, the MCO. So um, for education level, there's no, no significant difference in, uh, for depression or not. Uh, but those who perceive to be in poorer health, they were at higher odds for depression. Similarly, for um, those who had more severe acute COVID-19 infection, they also had higher odds for um, depression as well as those with long COVID. So these few groups of uh, patients who, who had severe acute COVID condition as well as long COVID, they perceive themselves to be in poorer health currently, so they, they were more likely to, um, to be at risk for uh, depression. And those in the overweight obese categories, they were also at higher odds for depression because overweight obesity and depression, they are interlinked and both are affected by inflammation. So um, while interpreting the results, there are some limitations in the study which we need to uh, discuss. First, um, we did not screen for pre-existing mental health disorders among the participants and we did not inquire about COVID-19 related stressors like death or serious illness of a loved one or loss of income. We didn't investigate that. And as we can see that um, our participants were younger, more educated and IT savvy, where this is a selection bias because uh, the study was conducted online. So we had more uh, participants in this uh, age group and with higher education. However, um, our studies may be one of the few studies that explore mental health status among COVID-19 survivors, as well as this will provide important information for planning of mental health services for post-COVID-19 care. So the implication of our studies is that our findings reinforce that mental health status of COVID-19 survivors should not be ignored because we know that depressive disorders are associated with markedly increased risk of morbidity and mortality. We should promote awareness of the increased risk of mental health disorder among COVID-19 survivors. And we should have integration of mental health care as a core component of post-COVID-19 care strategies. And the programs should be targeted at the associated factors. In conclusion, a substantial uh, proportion of COVID-19 survivors were found to be at risk for depression and factors associated with depression were females, younger age groups, overweight obesity, severity of acute COVID-19 infection, long COVID and perceived poor health. So strengthening access to mental health services would and ensure early assessment and prompt treatment to be incorporated as a core component in the post-COVID-19 care strategies, targeting at the risk factors. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Q from the Department of Pharmacology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Today, I would like to introduce to you our recent work in the development of an electrochemical spectroscopy-based biosensing platform for the rapid screening of SARS-CoV-2 cell binding inhibitors. According to the latest statistics, SARS-CoV-2 has infected more than 538 million people and caused over 6.3 million deaths worldwide. Although vaccination of the world population is in progress, 
effective therapeutic agents against the infection is yet in demand to date. During the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, our research group in the University Malaya has attempted a quick project with the researchers of a few major universities and hospitals in Taiwan to develop a biosensing platform for the rapid screening of drugs against SARS-CoV-2 infections, specifically those that suppresses the entry of the SARS-CoV-2 virus into the cells. From the past research, we understand that SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for the COVID-19 infections, infects our cell by binding to the cell surface ACE2 receptor through its spike protein, or the S protein. Thus, if we can find a drug that stops the virus S protein from binding to this receptor, we may prevent the virus from entering the cells thus slow or reduce the severity of this infection. This will also give the body more time to mount an efficient immune response against the infection, particularly in the vaccinated patients. So to identify these drugs, a biosensing platform that consists of palladium nanotin flame chip coated with a layer of recombinant ACE2 receptor and connected to a signaling sensing circuit was fabricated. This platform detects the inhibitors against S protein ACE2 binding through firstly recording the electrochemical impedance signals generated by the binding of the S protein to the ACE2 coated chips in the absence of these inhibitors so as to produce a dose response curve as shown by the black line over here and then to monitor the changes of such signal series and also to the dose response curve in the presence of the inhibitors. So in principle, if an inhibitor to the S protein ACE2 binding is present, this drug will likely interact with the ACE2 on the sensor chip and changes their conformation. So as a result, the S protein will not be able to bind properly to the ACE2 and a decrease or disappearance in the detection signals will be seen. This platform can identify inhibitors at a low drug sample volume as low as 1 microliter and within 20 minutes. This makes it useful for the rapid screening of the binding inhibitors from among the repurposed drugs or even from the new compound library, especially those that are available at a small amount. So prior to the drug screening studies, we have assessed the specificity of the biosensors in binding the S protein by exposing the sensors to different types of proteins. We found that the sensors generated concentration-dependent signals only when exposed to the S protein or SARS-CoV-2 pseudovirus, but not to the other common proteins such as lysozyme or albumin. This ascertained the specificity of the sensors in binding the S protein and justify its use to study the protein ACE2 interactions. Through this platform, we have successfully identified a few drug candidates that inhibits SARS-CoV-2 binding to the ACE2 receptors at molecular level. This includes perindopril and ramipril, which belongs to the drug family of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors. This is a class of drug that are commonly used to treat hypertension presently. In our studies, perindopril and ramipril was found to suppress S protein ACE2 binding respectively by 48 and 42 percent, while their active metabolites perindoprilate and ramiprilate further suppress the S protein ACE2 binding respectively by 67% and 72%. Unexpectedly, some drugs that enhance the S protein ACE2 binding were also identified through this biosensing setup. This include enalapril and its metabolite enalaprilate that enhance the S protein ACE2 binding respectively by 25 and 174 folds, and also lisinopril that enhances S protein ACE2 binding by 67 folds. These findings were subsequently confirmed by our colleagues in the Changgong University Hospital through the in vitro experiments that evaluate the SARS CoV 2 infectivity in ACE2 expressing cells, whereby the virus' ability to infect the cells were found to reduce when the cells were treated with ramipril and perindopril and also their metabolites, but increased when the cells were treated with enalapril and enalaprilat and lisinopril. The recorded difference in the effects of different ACE inhibitor drug subtypes onto the S protein ACE2 binding may be correlated to the structural difference between these subtypes. That is, the ACE inhibitors that possess a bulky group of the rigid fuse ring in their structure 
as shown over here the double ring such as the cyclopenta B pyro 2 carboxylic acid moiety in the ramipril and ramiprilat and the 1H indo 2 carboxylic acid moiety in the perindopril and perindopril we antagonize the ACE2 S protein binding whereas ACE inhibitors without such bulky groups such as enalapril and enalapril and also lisinopril may positively modulate the ACE2 S protein binding on the other hand the presence of the carboxyl terminals at the glycine myotis of the ACE inhibitors may further enhance their activities, no matter for the antagonizing effects of ramipril, perindopril, and also their metabolites, or the positive modulating effects of enalapril, enalaprilate, and lisinopril. Meanwhile, an n amine side chain at the l lysyl moiety of the lisinopril may weaken its positive modulating effects on the ACE2S protein binding. The inhibitory effects exhibited by the ramipril, ramiprilat, perindopril, and perindopilat may indicate the potentials of these drugs and molecules with similar chemical structures to be further developed as adjunctive agents for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2 infections. Meanwhile, the findings on the lisinopril, enalapril, and enalapril's enhancement on the ACE2S protein binding as well as SARS-CoV-2 infectivity may be of clinical importance as it may suggest an increased risk of SARS-CoV-2 infections in the patients who are on these medications, in particular the patients with hypertension and cardiovascular disorders. Nevertheless, these findings are still of preliminary nature, and further studies are currently in progress to assess the in vivo and also clinical effects of the drug candidates identified. So further details of the current discovery can be found in the following documentations. It is the hope that the platform and the findings generated from this study can contribute to the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still significantly affected our daily lives even at these moments. Here on behalf of the joint research team, I would like to express our gratitude to the following party who have supported the research, which is the Ministry of Science and Technology Taiwan, the Ministry of Education Taiwan, National Yangming Chaotong University, Changgong University and Changgong Hospital, National Changgong University, National Changhua University of Education, Wanfang Hospital and Taipei Medical University, Taipei Veterans Hospital, and last but not least, our University Malaya. So with this, I end my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Qin Hai, and I'm from the UM eHealth Unit, Faculty of Medicine, University of Malaya. Today, on behalf of my team, I'll be sharing with everyone about COSMOS, which stands for COVID-19 Symptom Monitoring System. Here's what I'm going to share with everyone today. I will start with history and rationale for developing COSMOS, its development process, what is COSMOS, impact of COSMOS, as well as the evolution of COSMOS. Most of us are aware that the WHO declared COVID-19 a worldwide pandemic on 11 March 2020. In Malaysia, we implemented the Movement Control Order on the 18th March 2020. In those earlier days, all COVID-19 positive patients are admitted when diagnosed. Patients who are suspected with COVID-19 are sent home to self-quarantine. This is due to the lack of hospital beds, hence not all patients can be admitted. Let's take a look at the data on the 27th March 2020. There were about 6,500 people who have undergone COVID-19 testing, which probably due to they are having symptoms or they are close contact. Out of the number, 255 were diagnosed positive and admitted, while 6,200 85 were sent home for self-monitoring. If you do the math, for every positive COVID-19 patient diagnosed, there are 25 others to be taken care of via home monitoring as these people might develop symptoms at any time. The district health office staff are tasked to call this patient every day to check on their symptoms and advise accordingly. However, Due to the high work burden, which takes about 10 minutes per call, with limited manpower in the healthcare system, 
led to these patients not well monitored. In the University of Malaya Medical Center, we saw many of the home monitoring patients who came in when their symptoms have seriously worsened. These patients are not sure what to do at home and they need guidance. Subsequently, the core team first met by Zoom to explore the problems in depth. This discussion was led by the clinical team, which consists of a panel of seven experts from the primary care services and computer scientists including current and ex-students of the Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology in the University of Malaya. The problems identified were then converted to the requirements of the system, including the functions and the features. The integration of COSMOS into the existing clinical workflow was also discussed. Now, as you can see on the chart, the COSMOS was developed, tested and launched in 21 days due to the urgent need. We used the Agile development process model to develop COSMOS. So what is COSMOS? COSMOS is a system to assess patients' COVID-19 symptoms at home and provide automated feedback based on algorithm and it is coupled with teleconsultation service. There are two components in Cosmos. The first part is the chatbot which is delivered via the Telegram app to be used by the patients. The other component is the dashboard which the doctors use to monitor the patients. From the patient's end, Cosmos provides an assessment chatbot we also push educational self-care materials to the patients and patients can also communicate with the doctors if necessary. So this is how COSMOS is implemented in clinical setting. When patients come to the hospital, if their condition is severe, they will be admitted to the ward. If their conditions are mild or asymptomatic, they will be asked to activate COSMOS in their phone. Every morning, they will receive a ping in the telegram to submit their health status every day. The Cosmos bot will provide automated response following an algorithm we have developed, whether the patient can continue to stay home or they need to call the Cosmos doctor immediately. When the patient calls the Cosmos doctor, the doctor will assess the patient's condition and advise whether they can stay home, repeat using Cosmos for 14 days, or they need to go to the hospital immediately. At the same time, the doctor will also monitor the COSMOS database. The COSMOS will alert the doctor if there's any serious case that they need attention. The doctor will call the patient with worsened condition immediately to provide some advice. Next, you might ask, why Telegram? This is because we considered user-centered design and implementation factors. We have to develop something that is easy to learn, avoid steep learning curve. In this case, the users are already familiar with messaging apps such as WhatsApp. Telegram is just another example of that. Secondly, Telegram has a very simple interface with clickable buttons. It is very easy to use. The approval of licensing of Telegram is also very fast. Developing something within Telegram is also faster than developing something new. And last but not least, there are increasing numbers of users of Telegram as the National Security Council is also using it to disseminate COVID-19 information. Cosmos started as a research, but towards the end, the U UMMC decided to absorb it as a full service. And as you can see on the picture here, these are some of the warriors or the doctors, the medical officers who are monitoring the database in the Cosmos, as well as doing the teleconsultation with the patient at home. This is how the dashboard of the Cosmos look like. It summarizes how many patients have not reported their symptom, how many reported but found unstable where the doctor needs to call back. The doctor can also click in into the dashboard to see which patient are the one that needs help and all the status by symptoms are shown in details. In terms of the impact, Cosmos provides automated feedback to patients based on risk. 
it filters out stable patients and highlight unstable patients for the doctors to manage. This is more efficient use of healthcare workforce and at the same time ensure patients who need attention are taken care of. We conducted utility and usability study with users of Cosmos. One of the patients mentioned that the system also enabled the doctor to monitor me closely on a daily basis. I used to type and then there will be instant feedback. So in that sense that you feel reassured that I'm not alone. Unlike the card method, the doctors will only see after 14 days. Another patient said, said that, yeah, it's very simple and very easy to use and the reminders are all there. The doctors also feedback that we can reduce the burden of doctors in the clinic. We can also protect our doctors, our healthcare workers. At one point of the study, we found that Cosmos reduced 87% of doctors' workload in monitoring patients with suspected COVID-19 infection based on the data on 19 June 2020. In UMMC, our team focused very much on our patient as we have control over the system and we can integrate Cosmos in our clinical workflow. Beyond UMMC, we shared the idea of Cosmos to Sri Lanka and My Sejatra team too in the earlier days so that it could be also used to improve care of the home monitoring patients. Besides that, we actually replicated Cosmos to be adopted and used in a clinic in a district health office. This is one of the reports from the district health office on the 10 December 2020. There were about 3,000 patients reported daily and out of those, only 193, which is about 6.4%, needs to be called by the doctors. Just imagine how much resources would be not efficiently used to call the other stable patients. This is another evaluation report done in UMMC from January to August 2021. There were 700 73 patients who were monitored via Cosmos and out of those 94 patients were escalated to inpatient care. Among the 94, 11 required oxygen upon arrival at UMMC and of course there was no death among the patients monitored via Cosmos. Without proper guidance, these patients could have come in worse or even brought in death. We surveyed the users of Cosmos and most are happy with the home monitoring system. Most users agreed that it is better or at least similar to face-to-face -face care. Now, the use of Cosmos has evolved over time. It was used to monitor positive COVID-19 patients as well, but only category 1 and 2 over the time when positive cases drastically increased. Besides that, it was also expanded to be used for UMMC staff as well as children. Cosmos was also upgraded to the Gen 2 version where it has the authoring tool for the doctors. The questions in the chat box can be tweaked by the doctors or the team in view of the changing clinical evidence on the COVID-19 symptoms. This whole system can be replicated for use in monitoring other diseases such as dengue, palliative, as well as cancer care. Now, I just would like to demo how the Cosmos looks like in the Telegram app. As you can see here, there are three languages in the Cosmos and this is the Gen 1 and this is the Gen 2 version of Cosmos. Let's look at Gen 1 first. When you click restart button, okay, you get a question, how is your cough? So there are options for you to choose. Cough remains as yesterday. How is your sore throat? No sore throat today. How is your fever? Mm, started having fever today. Difficulty in breathing? No. Chest pain? Now, face turning blue, lips turning blue, no. Drowsy? Yes. Any other symptoms? Yes. What is it? You can type anything at this time. I think we put headache. Please check and then confirm. No change to be made. Okay, your condition has changed. Please call UMMC at the number. Just click on the number and you can call UMMC right away. Okay, so that's how the Gen 1 looks like. Now let's look at the Gen 2. Okay, when you click start, you get a link. When you click on the link, it will open up a web base. 
assessment system, the chatbot is within a website inside the telegram. Okay, so the, the questions are almost similar, but as I mentioned before, we have tweaked some of the questions. Cough? No. Difficulty breathing? No. Fever? No. Diarrhea? Vomiting? No. Eating less or drinking less? Chest pain? Face turning blue? Drowsy? Same. Oxygen level? Now we ask oxygen level. Okay. And submit. Then you get your outcome. Your condition is stable and you continue to stay home and so on. Alright, that's how Cosmos looks like in Telegram. Okay, just to also share that we have published some of our work in our journal papers. We would like to thank UM and Yayasan Busan Malaysia for funding this project, UMMC for supporting this initiative towards digital transformation of healthcare, Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology for the collaboration. That's it. Thank you for listening.